Good evening, everyone. Hi, to everyone that's joined us so far. Uh, we're going to get started with a just quick introduction of our uh, guest speaker this evening. Um, again, thanks everyone for joining us. This is a you know, really important event for ourselves as a, as a manufacturer of waterproofing products. And we're really lucky to be able to run these type of events. Um, you know, these not only benefit you guys that are joining us, but also us. Um, it's really great to get the engagement and really have the opportunity to be able to hear um, you know, your thoughts and any questions you might have, whether they're product related or not. Um, and this is why we're sort of running this, this event this afternoon. It's really just um, to drive that engagement and really for everyone to understand that there's a lot of support out there. There's you know passionate people throughout the industry that are really pushing and working towards making a difference and having a real positive impact um, with the day-to-day -day applications of, of waterproofing systems. So I'd like to really start off by just introducing Frank Mobus. He's a highly experienced and qualified professional with over 35 years of experience in the waterproofing and tiling industry. And I'm sure many of you are already familiar with some of Frank's work. Um, he's passionate about his work and he's dedicated to providing the highest quality standards. Frank is a member of many industry organisations. These include Standards Australia, the International Standards Organisation, Artibus Innovation and the Australian Institute of Waterproofing, just to name a few. He's also a certified surveyor of structural waterproofing, a cert for training and assessing, and certificate for in water and floor tiling, also just naming a few of his qualifications. Frank has played a significant role in the development of the Australian standards for waterproofing, and he was instrumental in creating the newly, newly developed diploma in waterproofing design. He's also a regular speaker at industry events, and he's a valuable resource for those who are interested in learning more about waterproofing and tiling. We are grateful to have Frank joining us today to share his knowledge and experience, and I'm sure that you will find his, his presentation informative and engaging. So thanks again to Frank. All right, thanks very much. No drama. Good to be here. So I didn't miss anything, no. Frank, as far no. as... Uh... <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. There's a couple of things you could have added, but that's okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so I think we should just really, you know, get stuck straight into it as far as what we're here to sort of talk about this evening, um, which is really about quality control and we'll also be covering a bit of the industry updates as well. Um, but really as a starting question, I suppose, um, and it's a question that comes up a lot, is really just the importance of project planning. So what, what are your sort of, if we look at that specific topic, what are some of the pointers and from your experience, things that work and how things should be done? Well, look, a lot of mistakes happen in, in not just in waterproofing, in, in any trade as a result of poor planning. You know? And realistically, um, at the beginning of a project, during the design stage of, of the building is, is actually when people should be uh, starting to engage the waterproofing membrane manufacturer or system manufacturer to see, uh, you know, to get their input at that time so that we don't design on the go. You know, certainly uh, you want to have all the designs squared away before you before you start building. That's really the ideal thing to do. And getting engaging the waterproofing manufacturer at, you know, at an early stage is a really, really good idea. And look, sometimes you need to involve a couple of manufacturers. You know, one manufacturer may not have a solution for everything that's required in that building. That's just the, uh, the way it goes. Yeah. So I think um, the other day when I was speaking to you, you, you know, I think one of the main points that sort of resonated with me was really, you know, everyone is involved and everyone plays a mm -hmm. role, right? So... Um, well, and that, and that is, th that's true. Uh, and, and that, but that comes back more to uh, when we're actually starting to build, yeah. All right. So, so 
you know, one of the things I like to do on projects that I'm involved with, and, and not, not every builder, you know, does it, but I, I recommend that prior to constructing any wet areas, we have a, a pre-construction meeting with every trade that's involved. So, you know, and, and then you, you really talk out the entire process, um, what goes in what order, you know, you talk about, you know, things like how many fixings you need to have on the sheet based on the weight of the tiles that are going to be installed later on. Um, you know, how big a hole the plasterers can cut into the, into the plasterboard not to really make it difficult for the waterproofer. They're all the things you, you, you discuss early um, with, with everybody involved and, and then you move forward, you know. Is, are you better off with the new standards to um, screed first or do you have enough fall in the structure to waterproof first and then screed? You know, these are the sort of things you, know, you need to discuss prior to construction. And, and then what I tend to advise is after you've, you've come to an agreement on how everything goes, um, then you build a prototype. That's when you, uh, you uh, iron out all the, you know, any issues that arise. And once the prototype's built, everyone's happy, happy with the outcome, then away you go. Yep. Yeah. And what, what happens then is you tend to have fewer defects and you also speed up the program time because everybody knows what they're doing and how it should be done. There's no reworks, no complaints from the waterproof and the other plasterers didn't do this properly. You know, everyone knows what's going on and you save a lot of time and money and reworks. Yeah, no, so that, that'll make sense, you know. So really just to recap, what you're saying is, you know, there is definitely it should be starting at the design stage. So before, you know, anyone's on site we should be looking at the designs engaging with the manufacturer of you know whatever components might be in for example use a wet area as the example you know you've got the lighting board guys you know the point that he raised about you know the screeds that's going to determine your set downs to make sure that you've got enough gradient to the drains um, and then from there once everyone's happy with the design and everything's going to work in it's about getting all the parties involved to you know look at the prototype build a, a prototype um, you know, and then just anything that's not, that, that people aren't agreeing with, you can adjust and then you can just flow on from there. Everyone understand what that's needs it, to be constructed. It. Yeah. Yep. yeah. No, and then the other thing of, that, that is very important to talk through during the design stage is a product compliance, you know, make sure the products you're, you're specifying or that have been, been proposed actually comply with the required standards. And the, other, and the next thing is product compatibility to ensure that if you're using a ceramic tiling system in that wet area, that the membrane and tile adhesive system are compatible. Yeah. And, you know, there is now Australian standards that test waterproof and membrane compatibility with tile adhesive systems. That's in the, uh, in the tile adhesive suite of standards. Yeah. yeah. All right. So second question um really just project monitoring and supervision um so again we kind of discussed this the other day um and you were sort of making some points around some strategies and processes um you know and some and some points and tips for when engaging third party inspectors as well so yeah obviously ongoing monitoring and ongoing supervision is very important you know, and that's not just from the uh, the builders on-site form and on-site supervisors clearly they they have a responsibility to supervise the contractors on site and clearly they should have an idea of what it's supposed to look like for example when the waterproof is finished right? but you know the waterproofing waterproofing contractor obviously needs to for, needs to supervise the the individual applicators and workers on site as well and that's where we've got to make sure that everybody's competent, everyone knows what they're doing, everyone understands the manufacturer's instructions. I mean, they're pretty clearly written on the side of every bucket, so, you know, it's not hard to, to figure out those instructions. But, but, you know, when I go to site, quite often I see mix and match systems used, sealant from one manufacturer, 
membrane from a different manufacturer even though clearly the specification was something different so everyone needs to know understand what the specification is then we need some supervision to make sure it all gets done properly and when, when it's completed um, you're as aware as, as well as I am that the new waterproofing standard 2021 version now has a requirement for inspections before any overlaying finishes are applied, for example, tiles or vinyl, right? So, you, and these are the, you know, the, the things you need to cover before you say, okay, my wet area that I've just waterproofed is now ready for the tilers to come into. So that's, that visual inspection as a minimum needs to be ticked off. And then of course there's other things that you know you can um, you can bring in third party independent inspectors to uh, to do an independent assessment of the wet area that is done. And you know I've got examples in, in my previous role we worked with a builder who approached the company and said, look, we're spending millions and millions on remedial waterproofing works every year. Well, what can you do? So we put in place a system where the, where the project specification was written that included what primers, membranes, sealants, tile adhesive, the full system was specified and everyone agreed to adhere to that. After the membranes were applied and finished, then uh, a third party inspection was carried out on basically every single wet area. After that system was implemented, that builder has now built more than 50 buildings that don't have a single leak in them. So just by doing that and everyone being on the same page and everyone taking some responsibility, you can eliminate all those leaks. Yeah, accidents do happen, we know that, but in this particular case, more than 50 buildings without a problem. Yeah, so, so really you're highlighting again, the importance of having a clear process in place, you know, and always working towards, you know, the, the required outcome, which is, you know, a quality waterproofing application installation, right? So I'm assuming that you go out to site when you carry out your inspection, you'd be looking at, you know, obviously obvious things, pinholes, any damage, those type of things, but then you go further and check film thicknesses, make sure that the bond breakers were where they should be, how they should be installed, uh, were there any other checks that that you oh, do as well? Is it, or general? Yeah, well, the the, the the things that I used to come across that would be the biggest area of of, of a of a failure or a, or of a you know, do this again would be failing to properly prime any non-porous surfaces. Mm -hmm. Now, not putting a, a primer on the water stop angles or the puddle flanges. Sorry, they call it leak control flanges now, I guess. Yeah. Um, so that's 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 one thing in you know and, and i think it comes from when you first apply a membrane to the plastic lead control flange it actually feels like it's pretty well stuck for the first week or so but once the membrane's properly cured it just peels off yeah right so and that can that can lull people into a false sense of security so priming those surfaces is super important with a with a proper bonding bridge that's fit for purpose yeah, no, and I think um, just to sort of go back a little bit to, you know, project planning, there was a point you made the other day as well where, you know, you're pretty much making it clear that waterproofing should be treated for what it is, which is the last line of defence, right? So, you know, we got to make sure that definitely that part of it is solid. Um, but just, yeah, not to go back too much to our first question here, but this is where the design plays such a critical role. Oh, look, 100%, and, and look, you know, that's, it, it's a pretty deep rabbit hole you can fall into if you really explore this, right? But, you know, building code basically says that the requirement is to prevent water from, you know, entering into concealed spaces and, and behind fittings and linings, right? So that wording automatically, because it says prevent, tends to lead people to think, okay, how do I prevent water from going somewhere? Well, I'll put a barrier in front. By barrier, I mean a waterproofing membrane. Yeah. In my view, that's not the right way to think about it. All right. So, you know, I quite often when I talk to people, I say, okay, what is, 
what is it you need to have a, a water leak? And they say, oh, membrane too thin or pinhole or, you know, someone's cut a hole in the membrane, etc. Well, that's actually not entirely true. There's only really one thing you need for a water leak and that's water. If you don't have water, it doesn't matter how good your membrane is or how bad your membrane is, you won't have a leak, right? So the way I look at it is, well, if that's the case, then the first consideration should be to get the water down the, down the drainage pipe, which is one of the reasons why the building code is now implemented, the 180 falls in, on in where the floor waste is installed. Yeah. If you get most of your water down the drain, well, it's no longer there to cause your leak. Now we can talk about waterproofing membranes as a second line of defence. And that's really how we should be looking at waterproofing membranes rather than the, you know, I'll put a membrane there, therefore it won't leak. That's not the right approach as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. So I think, um, yeah, and, and I think really when we're talking about this sort of last line of defence and that second layer, it's we're really talking about longevity, right? We're making sure that buildings and wet areas, uh, you know, are going to be leak free for decades. That, that's the expectation from, you know, the homeowner or the asset owner. They're, they're not wanting to have to fix things and change their bathroom, for example, every five to ten years because there's a leak. So, um, well, yeah. it's, it's, whether the, it's, it's not that they don't want to. It, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it they're be. entitled to get yeah, yeah. what they pay for, right? And, yeah, and yeah. they did not pay for a leaky bathroom. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. all right. No, all right. Good points. Um, just. For those guys that are like commenting at the moment, just to let you know that we will cover all your questions um, at the end of the presentation. So um, I do see the comments. Thanks for everyone that's commenting and hello. Um, but we will hold until um, the end of the presentation just to just to make you guys aware. Uh, so flood testing, Frank, what are your thoughts? Well, another rabbit hole. But you know, if we're going to go there, you most will go down it. So flood testing will tell you whether a wet area that you're testing leaks at the time of the test. Mm -hmm. Well, that's 100% true, right? However, what it doesn't tell you is whether there's any longevity in the system. And just to give you an example, look, you can basically make a, a, a bathroom or a wet area pass a 24, even a 48 hour flood test with a primer, a bond breaker sealant and a coat of membrane, probably 20% of the required thickness will do that for, for 48 hours pretty easily. Right? Yeah. So does that mean that that is good QA? Probably not. You know, I mean, I've got photos of bathrooms that have passed 48 hour flood tests where there's pinholes in the membrane, where the membrane is so thin you can see through it, where there's actually bare patches of concrete. They've all passed flood tests. So yeah. yes, they've passed the flood test, but that doesn't mean that they're not gonna leak in three, four, five, six months time. Now, let alone, you know, lasting for 10 years to, to match the membrane, waterproofing membrane um, warranty. Yeah. So there's other ways. Certainly, a, a you know, as I said in, in the new waterproofing standard, the a visual inspection is a minimum requirement. Right? That has to be done, and because it has to be done, or every everyone uh, it should be recorded that it was done and what date and by whom. The standard doesn't say who has to do it. It doesn't say the waterproofer has to do it or the building supervisor has to do it or the tiler has to do it. It just says that it has to be done. Yeah. Right. Um, and like I said, therefore, it, should, it needs to be recorded. Right. The other things you can do, and it's probably heading towards a question you're going to ask me soon, which would be other methods of integrity testing, uh, are things like electronic leak detection or um, things like um, ultrasonic thickness tests, non-destructive thickness tests, right? Um, 
That's the other one. There's a there's another one I was thinking about the other day. So you got high voltage, low voltage. We talked yeah, about. Yeah, they're the two different. They're the two different types of, of ELD or electronic leak detection. Yeah, and then you're talking about seeing probe testing for sheet membranes as well. Ah, uh, the sheet membranes, yes. Which you know, they're not that many sheet membranes are used in wet areas at the moment. Mm -hmm. they, they seem to be getting more popularity because there's no curing time. Yeah. Um. But uh, certainly, the sand probe testing is pretty important. Yeah, so um, just to sort of go back to that flood testing. So the other thing that you're probably finding, um, just like myself at the moment, um, is I've been getting a lot of calls as far as, you know, especially in the colder areas, Canberra, Tasmania, Victoria, South Australia, where I am, which was a really nice sunny day today. Um, but it gets really cold. So, you know, the flood testing, so from what you're saying... You know, it gets cold in Queensland too, right? Yeah, some spots, yeah, I learned that the hard way <laughs> the other week. <laughs> So it does, but um, yeah. Look, it's it becomes almost impractical as well a lot of the time when you think about you know trying to you know job planning and get things done in a in a timely sort of manner. The flood test can sort of put a bit of a halt um, on the process in the colder months. And I've seen where you know it seems dry. They're not testing that it's completely cured. Everything becomes a lot more critical as well as far as have they cleaned the surface? Has it been prepared sufficiently enough? Is the membrane bonded and cured enough to be able to withstand sort of a flat test in, in a really short window? Um, yeah, but but even but even with the other tests, like for example, let's ultrasonic thickness tests, right? Yeah. They need to have a reasonably cured membrane to work, right? Mm -hmm. Because they shoot an ultrasound beam through the membrane and it bounces off the first surface that has more density than the than the layer it's gone through right yeah so if you applied your membrane in two coats as you should mm -hmm. um and then you come in and do an ultrasound test the the, the ultrasound might actually bounce block bounce back off the the top of the first layer of membrane right so even for those you need to have a cured a reasonably cured membrane so that the density of of the area you're testing is consistent all the way down to the substrate otherwise you'll get a false reading so it's very important with any testing you do that you have the membrane sufficiently cured and you have competent operators of the machinery yeah right so for example if you were you know, electronic leak detection right there so there's high voltage and low voltage now, low voltage requires you to put a film of water down and test and test it out and it looks for leaks and gives you a buzzing sound or whatever that machine comes if it finds a breach, right? That's fine. But if you're using high voltage in a membrane, is a water-based membrane and hasn't fully cured, um, that, that can cause you problems, right? And the other thing with high voltage, if you turn it up too high, it can actually punch a hole through the membrane anyway. Right. So you got to again, you got to make sure that people know what they're doing when they're using the equipment. In yeah. addition to that, they also need to know what they're looking at. It's no good having a third-party inspector to come out, and all they know is how to operate the machines. And they should be able to walk into a room saying, "Hey, that wall should have a membrane on it." Why isn't? It? For example. Yeah. yeah. So, so the curing doesn't just affect the flood testing, it affects everything, right? Yeah. And, you know, if you're using, it doesn't matter what you're using. If you're using moisture cured membranes like polyurethane type membranes, well, they rely on moisture in the air. So quite often when it's cold, there's relatively low humidity. So even those are slowed down. Cementitious membranes, you know, the curing process stops at a certain temperature. You know, if it gets, I think it's less than five degrees, pretty much cementitious systems stop curing, so they'll stay wet. Um, Water-based systems, well, you know, the colder it gets, the longer they take. So it's a really good idea to uh, to manage your um, the spaces you're working in, reducing the humidity, if you're using water-based membranes, raising the temperature prior to application, not not after. Yeah. 
Yeah. If you get the rooms at a reasonable temperature before you start, then the whole system will cure as normal. Yeah. Fortunately, there is no... Now, I quite often get asked, oh, I'm in Canberra at the moment, how long should I wait for a membrane before my membrane's cured? Well, <laughs> how long's a piece of string? You, you just can't answer that question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. As you know, a lot of factors, you know, and they're all sort of working against the curing. You know, cold weather, mm. high humidity, surface temperature, moisture content of that surface, you know, wind. Correct. You know, there's so many factors that, that would affect the cure. So it's, it's a really good well, point. And, and, and I don't know, you know, I've, I've gone to quite a lot of, of buildings that are under construction, and for some reason, quite often, the builders program the waterproof it into the rooms at the same time as the painter. So what's the painter want to do? The painter wants to tape everything up, make sure all the windows are closed, there's no airflow. Yeah. Then he wants to spray everything, so he introduces a hell of a lot more moisture into the air. And then it, and then you also waterproofing wet areas with water-based membranes. So, you know, you've got virtually no chance of, of everything curing at a reasonable amount of time. So that, that sort of we've led into our our next question there, Frank, as well, which was really around recommendations and tips for control measures. So I think we've we've covered sort of the stuff when it comes to relative humidity and and those sort of things, but we touched on you know the importance of surface prep um, as well as far as avoiding things like pinholing and, and stuff like that. Is well, that... you know, it's 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 important to make sure that the moisture content of the substrate is compatible with the membrane system you're applying. Right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're, and, and again, it's a requirement of the new waterproofing standard to actually test it. And, you know, I've seen a lot of manufacturers that have now started to put on their instructions in you know, the minimum moisture content requirement, you know, for, for say concrete, you know, has to be less equal to or less than 75% relative humidity before you can put a membrane on there without a moisture barrier. So that's pretty important. Um, personally, I'm a fan of, of moisture barriers or slash epoxy primers in any case, because it, it just, you know, just takes a lot of variables out of the way and the adhesion is vastly improved if, if you do the, the adhesion testing from a, compared to um, when you're comparing epoxy and, and water-based primers. But it's not everyone's cup of tea. Yep. So, and what happens is, you know, in um, if you put in a moisture cured membrane down, and if you got a moist substrate, well, you're going to get bubbles in your membrane for sure, right? and you're going to get you know, the, the possibility of delamination. If you're using a water-based membrane, you can also get small bubbles, but yeah, you know, your, your membrane will take forever to cure because it's just there's not enough. It, it, there's not enough, uh, there's more moisture in the entire system than the air surrounding it can handle. It's probably the best way to describe it. Yeah. So, you know, really the, the common theme, you know, as a, as a response to all these questions is again, having a process, quality control process there, understanding what, uh, you know, what, what are the, you know, What's what I'm looking for? What are the variables and how to manage them to be able to come up with a consistent outcome every time, right? So, mm. you know, and this no, is it's, where... It's like I said, it's a lot easier to control, you know, when you're building a multi-story buildings, right? Yep. Because then, then you can have the, the pre-construction meetings, you mm -hmm. can have the prototype, you, you can you can check it as you go. I know it's, it's significantly different than, different in the housing sector. Mm -hmm. You know, you're walking into a house, the foreman's told you, oh, this house is ready, you get there, and it's quite often far from ready yeah. you know, for, for yeah. waterproof. I, I understand there's a big difference in the two, but, you know, it's certainly a lot easier when you're doing in commercial construction. Yeah, but, the, you know, but it really it's all about setting the expectations, right, and standing your ground as a contractor to ensuring that the, the customer that you're working with your client understands what the expectation is for them to be able to successfully contribute to the construction right so 
you know, and you see it as much as I see it. And it's the number one frustration of all our end users, right? So all the guys out there in the field that are using our products, the number one frustration that you hear time and time again is that no one seems to be taking taking it seriously enough, right? And this is where the standard has done a really good job of, you know, forcing that process, forcing those things. But I think, you know, as um, we'll, we'll talk about it at the end, and this is where, you know, a lot of, there is some frustration with what's happened in volume two, you know, where a lot of that stuff's been kind of taken away. But the fact that it exists in the standard, it does empower the contractor to, if, you know, if they're, you know, really pushing themselves to actually buy the standard, understand it, you know, joining into these sort of events, contacting you, you know, these things is going to make them more able and better equipped to be able to get their clients to understand the importance. And if that doesn't work, then maybe they should look at, you know, other avenues, <laughs> you know, who's the other builders that are around that do, because it is very frustrating from, you know, a contractor's standpoint or point of view that, you know, I'm sure a lot of this stuff isn't new to a lot of the guys out there. Some, yeah, it might be, but a lot of the guys understand their job at their day to day. They see firsthand where they're having issues time and time again. They kind of get it, you know, but um, yeah, I just thought I'd add that in there because it is something that it seems to be a common sort of theme that, that we come across. Yeah, for sure. You know, and you, know, you, you might do a, you know, a Cert 3 in waterproofing and, and that. And on, on that, once you have that, you can get you, you can get a contractor license in Queensland and in New South Wales. And I think Victoria is just starting to go down that line. And I don't know whether there's licensing for waterproofers in uh, in South Australia or not. But you know, just because you have a Cert Three in waterproofing and you're technically competent, doesn't automatically translate into being confident enough to stand your ground when things aren't right. And you really need to, uh, but you know, the uh, the running on a, of a business and, and what's what's involved. That's probably a whole other webinar. Yeah, 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 yeah. But nah, and and this is where you know, if um, if I have guys come to me, I will always push them towards engaging with someone like yourself. You know. Arm yourself with that's someone like that you're going to say, I was, you're going to push it towards Gripset products. <laughs> nah, look, that's, we, we don't, so for me, I'm not the sales guy, right? So, and if the sales guys are on, forgive me that I haven't mentioned our products, but the reality is it's, it's really about having the best in, impact. So from, like oh, yourself, yeah, Frank, from my position, I deal with the issues, right? So if I, I can empower the guy, though, sorry. Yeah. Go on. I think it's a great thing that a group set is putting these sort of things on without actually forcing group set products down people's throats, mate. Yeah, uh, nah, cheers, mate. Yeah, because look, at the end of the day, this kind of thing makes the industry better and it makes things flow easier for everybody that's involved, right? If we had an army of super competent builders that use super competent waterproofers that were engaging with the right people, doing these things that you're suggesting, project planning, regardless whether it's residential or commercial, then you know, it, it's just, it's the best way forward, you know, would be in a, but, in a very know, good, even, good even, position. Even in housing, right? So the majority of houses, the waterproofing and tiling is pretty much the same as the house you just finished yesterday, right? And, and so there's no reason why you can't have a conversation with the builder as a as the waterproof or the tiler and go, hey, haven't we have a, before we do the next 50 houses and do the same mistakes over and over and over again, haven't we have yeah. a sit down and have a chat about how we should build these things and yeah. how we design them now that the requirements for falls are different and that the requirements for membrane on a uh, substrate with fall have, have, you know, are starting to come into force. But you really should be having these conversations yep. now with the builders to, to, to get it so everyone's on the same page. Yeah, agree. Yeah, super critical. Um, so yeah, the, I think it's the second last question of the night. So we have residential building defects. So how to avoid these and do it properly? Um, you know, just sort of some 
last thoughts on that. We, we've pretty much gone through the process, right? But well, well, look, the best time to rectify defects is before you started actually started the project. You know, look at the design, make sure the design is workable. You know, I don't know if there's any architects in the room, but architects are very very good at drawing a dashed line onto a set of drawings and say, here, this is where the waterproofing membrane goes. That may not be the right place for the membrane to go. You know? yeah. And that's, you know, so you can eliminate a problem while the stuff's still on paper. Um, then during construction, you know, like I said, pre-construction meetings, let every, get everyone involved, you know, doing a successful wet area is realistically everyone's responsibility, not just, you know, the waterproofers. Let's all get involved. Let's make sure that the substrate that's prepared is, is correct. If it's not, well, let's at least empower the waterproofing applicator to say, hey, this isn't right. This is what needs to be done to fix it, right? Then not just say, which I've heard so many times, well, if you don't want to do this, mate, you know, there's a hundred other guys who will do it. Well, that's a very, very poor approach from a builder's perspective. And then, you know, make sure the systems are compliant. Waterproofing membranes are tested and pass the testing. Make sure that the tiling systems that go on top of the membrane are compatible with the membrane, they're compatible with the tiles, et cetera, et cetera. Same for vinyl. Um, you can put vinyl systems on top of membranes, you know, make sure the adhesives aren't of a chemistry that will act, that has solvents in it and actually eats the membrane underneath. That's not ideal. Um, make sure there is proper supervision. I believe in independent third party testing. Again, very, a lot easier to do in commercial construction when you're building multi-storey buildings. In housing, you know, I recommend to builders, maybe if you're building 50 houses a year, have the independent person or people turn up to 10 houses randomly. You know, don't, you know, if you, if you don't, if you don't have the, if you don't want to check every one, do 20%, do 10%, do something, at least keep the people on, you know, everyone then knows, okay, someone might check this, you know, maybe I should do it right. Yeah. And I'm not saying that people are going, waking up in the morning and, and going out, oh, today I'm really going to do a bad job, right? I don't think anyone does that, but people do make mistakes. Yeah, yeah. No, which is something we talk about all the time as well, right? Like, and this is where we, you know, we, when we talk about systems in our products, um, it's really about trying to create a system that's simplistic, you know, as mm. least amount of elements as possible to take away that risk of human error that does occur you know let's yeah. we're all different first thing in the morning after we've had our coffee compared to you know as the day goes on at the end of the day you know fatigue yeah. kicks in all sorts of things so um yeah i think this is again and, and, okay you know goes back to that quality control process you know like, like you're suggesting that's right yeah. and you know cover your own butt yeah, everyone now carries around a, uh, a, t a phone with really, really good quality cameras. Take photos off your completed work. Yeah. You know, when I left this place, the membrane was intact. Then someone decided to cut a hole in it. Why is that my problem? Yeah. I'll fix it for you, all right? But, you know, it's not my fault. Yeah. All right. And then, um, the final sort of topic that we had was really just improving current processes, practices and and policies, which were really, you know, based around what we, what we mentioned before, waterproofing membranes, not really being looked at as a primary defense, but just an element of the bigger yeah. system, right? That, that's, that's probably one of my main bugbears is that you know, people think of, you know, I don't want this to leak, therefore I'll put a membrane there. If you if if your first consideration is getting the water down the drainage pipe and doing that you know quickly, and then the membrane system is a secondary layer of defence, 
I reckon that's probably the way to go. You know, I've been to investigated part of my job. You know, I do leak detection. I do investigations of why things leak for the courts. One example I like to use is a building that was built in 1985 in Brisbane. And everyone was saying, these balconies are leaking, therefore we need to you know, replace them all and the cost is two and a half million dollars. Mm-hmm. And they've had various inspectors there and they said, oh yeah, definitely leave the waterproofing membranes failed. Okay, so they asked me to go there and I had a bit of a look and I thought, hang on, this was built in 85. I'm, I'll put my house on that there's not even a waterproofing membrane here. So we, we found the loose tile, took the tile up, bingo, no waterproofing membrane. Right. And then we did flood testing, localised where they reckoned there were leaks, and no leaks after the flood testing. So then I decided to get my drone out and have a look at the facade and, and the roof, and bingo, there's four missing roof tiles. No wonder the thing was leaking, right? But obviously, yeah. immediately, the the um, the uh, the balconies get the blame. Now, my point here is that there's no membrane there, and the things weren't leaking. Yeah. So we can actually build these things without membranes, and they don't leak. Right? So if they had a waterproof, so these people would have spent millions of dollars on replacing all these balconies and it would have still leaked because no one checked the roof. Yeah. So first line of defense should not be the membrane. Right. And you know, even people think, oh, I did flood testing on this room, therefore oh, therefore um, I'm forever, my, my butt's covered. Well, again, not the case. Just because it's flood tested, just means it, it didn't leak that day. But you've got to give them a, a much longer warranty than one day in, in, in most jurisdictions. Yeah. Good. And I think um, we should probably finish off with just addressing what really has been referred to as the elephant in the room um, when we talk about compliance. And maybe if you could provide some clarity as far as a volume two of the NCC residential and the two... Oh, you, you, t- you want to know about the deemed to satisfy solutions? All right, so yeah. in volume one, which is commercial construction, um, it's easy. Yeah. The deemed to satisfy um, solution is you, things must be, uh, building elements must be waterproof or water resistance as accord- in accordance with specification 26 and you have to follow AS 3740, right? You've got no options, easy. Uh In housing, the building codes boards decided to give us options, which I'll have a view about, which is probably, this is probably not the right forum to talk about that, but it now basically says you have to be waterproof or water resistant um, in, in accordance with a section of the new housing provisions and you need to follow 3740, that's one option. The other option is that you follow the uh, provisions of the, uh, follow the housing provisions solution for waterproofing. Right? So the housing provisions themselves give you something that's akin to a waterproofing standard. Right? Now, what it actually is, it's pretty much the 2004 version of AS3740 copied and pasted into the building code. So the main differences there are, is that realistic, the, probably the, the, the one that makes, that has the biggest impact is that in 3740, you're required to put the membrane onto the substrate with fall to the drain. If you follow the housing provisions, you need you don't have to put the membrane onto a substrate with fall you can put it onto a flat surface even if there's a waste in the room Mm -hmm. now again if you want to follow the housing provisions that's fine 
However, you've got to be careful that you also, at the same time, read the membrane manufacturer's recommendations. Because if you want to follow the housing provisions, but the waterproofing manufacturer says the membrane must be applied onto a substrate with fall, then guess what? You have to go onto the substrate with fall. You, you can't say the housing provisions say that, so I went onto a flat substrate. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. So how it's chopped up makes That's sense, it. but why it's been chopped up is still probably the biggest, uh, you know. Well, That's like I said, I have, a view, I have a view on, on yeah, whether yeah. that was a good idea or not. But yeah. yeah, well, uh, that, that's, this isn't the right forum for that one. Right. So the, probably the point here is, it doesn't matter which way you, want to, you choose to go, but read the manufacturer's recommendations in conjunction with the building code. Yeah. Right, because you really got to follow both. Yeah. All right. Well, that's pretty much um, wrapped up what we had planned to cover this evening, Frank. Again, thank you very much. Um, I think we have some time here now to maybe address some of these questions. I'm not sure, can, I think you can see them as well, Frank. Oh, I can't um, see the questions, mate. I, uh, had okay. the YouTube, I had the YouTube thing up, Yeah. but it had like a 30 second delay, so it's no Yeah, good. okay, okay. Um, so I'll just scroll through now. Um, Here. So we've got a few from from John Blaze. Um, so manufacturers only want the product, not the installation. So that's pretty well correct. Um, but you know the installation is connected to the warranty as well. So it does need to be installed, as Frank just mentioned, to the instructions. Um, and obviously this is where it becomes really important if you want to retain the warranties and everything to be um, as expected, then we should be inspecting and and you know, couldn't confirm that things have been installed correctly, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, and then you're asking the question, John, should they get more involved? You know? Who's that? So they, I think the manufacturer, John, I believe that's who you're referring to. They should get more involved, which this is how we get involved, right? So we're happy to be running forums and you know, we, we provide training programs, you know, we train our sales team the best we can as well to make sure that they have value out there in the field. Uh, but ultimately, uh -huh. the responsibility of the installation does does fall on the applicator. Right? It, it does, but I'll probably add something to that. Yep. Right? So I, I do not know a single manufacturer of any product that would not rather receive a phone call with a question from an installer prior to the uh, stuff up rather than having to go out to site later on um, to deal with a problem. So yes, manufacturers want to get involved, mm -hmm. but not at the end. They want to get involved at the start. You know, every, every manufacturer has technical departments or you know, people with, a, with an understanding of how the systems go together. Mm -hmm. When in doubt, make a phone call. No, that's Doesn't a really matter good point. what the question is. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Again, from John, the builder needs to make sure the design works and up to code, as nothing goes to plan after this, as a waterproofer does not doesn't know the bloody codes. You know, so I think it's oh, really waterproofers. Waterproofers should have an understanding of the waterproofing code. That's for sure. yeah. So I think what what. And I'm assuming, but I'm assuming that John is really just um, referring to the overall construction. This is this is when we're discussing, you know, the project planning, design, and those yeah. sort of elements. So, yeah, they, I agree. There should definitely be an understanding within the scope of works for the waterproofer. Um, but I also agree that if it's not done right, if it hasn't been constructed properly, it does become very difficult for that to be recognised by the waterproofing contractor sometimes. Yeah, look, and that's true. And you know, I I, I do quite a bit of work on in the liability insurance space, and, and quite often I'll, I'll, I get engaged by insurance companies where a claim's been lodged against a waterproofer. And um, look, I've had several of jo jobs where I've gone to side to investigate it, and I said, well, you haven't built it properly. So what chances the waterproofer got? You know, 
like Sky on Decks, for example, they, they always get built from. But, you know, and then the liability goes back to the builder. So does the waterproofer have to know how to build a deck? No, he doesn't, but it would be really good if he had an understanding what, he should, what it should look like before he starts waterproofing. And then just, um, again, just from John, um, when you look at the standard, uh, it looks like it's saying that waterproofing membrane is not the last one of the fence, question mark as well. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I think... That, the that's way the reason why the membrane has to go into a substrate before. Right? Yeah. So yes, you're right, John, without actually saying the standard doesn't say waterproofing membrane shouldn't be the it is the last line of defence. You, you should manage to water first. It's not it doesn't say that out loud, but that's what the intention is. Yeah. And I think just to add to that as well, like at the end of the day, it's part of the building. It's one of the elements of that building design, right? The waterproofing. So I think the standard has done a really good job at emphasising its importance. And really, there's a lot of literature in the new standard about the considerations that need to be made, things that need to be changed. Oh, right. the standard could certainly be better. I'm not certainly not happy with, 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 with uh, how the standard turned out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's, a, it's workable. There's, there's things in it that still drive me nuts and, and I'll, I'm a member of the committee, but I only have one vote. Yep. Um, where was I heading with this? But, um, yeah, on the whole, the thing is designed to give you the best chance to create a leak-free wet area if, you've, if you follow the standard and the manufacturer's instructions. Yeah. Uh, then we've got uh, Darren Hall. Can you cover again the requirements of the third party inspection? Is this now a requirement? So there is no requirement technically for a third party inspection. There is in internal wet areas, however, a requirement for a, 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 a minimum visual inspection prior to installing any overlaying finishes, i.e. tiles or vinyl. Right? So the requirement for that an inspection is carried out exists. Right? That, so that is a requirement. It is not a requirement to have that done by an independent third party. Any, anyone can do that inspection. Right? However, um, and look, this isn't me trying to get work for myself because I don't actually do those inspections. Um, a third party that is competent and has no skin in the game often gives you a better, a, a more comprehensive inspection than someone who's actually applied the membrane. But at the same time, you know, there's no benefit in the waterproofer inspecting the membrane and not picking out a defect. Yeah. It'd, be, it'd be crazy not to pick out the defect, right? So I have no objection against the waterproofer doing an inspection or the builder or the tiler, whoever. Someone, the fact is though, someone needs to do one. And because it's the requirement, you need to record that in the start. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose really to bring that point home as well is, you know, we had a situation here in, in Adelaide, you know, um, where we had some local inspectors that started using the ultrasonic fuel thickness testers, right? And because it was new to you know, our industry here, you know, a lot of contractors were you know, freaking out because, you know, they had applied membranes too thin and, and they were concerned. But they were really pushing their frustration, their concern that these guys had film thickness testing instead of really focusing on the benefit of having these guys because it deals with any issues up front, right? You're better off that process and learning from that process and improving the way that you apply product than having to go back in five years or three years or two years to then deal with something that's leaking or isn't right and getting stung at that end, right? Like just like we don't like getting involved at the end of the manufacturer, we like to get it up front. Yeah. You know, they should really be thinking the same way. 
Well, well, here's the thing, though, right? So I work relatively closely with, you know, many, many waterproofing contractors, right? And I know at least probably two dozen, maybe three dozen, who actually use the third-party testing as a selling, selling point for winning jobs. So they will quote a project and they will say, okay, if you give me the job, I actually get an independent third party to come out and check on my membrane before I hand it over to the tiler. So they use that as a selling point. Yeah. Right? Rather than, than fighting against the independent third party inspection with a thickness test, et cetera, they're using it as a, as a benefit of, of using them. Yeah. Right? And they, those guys are flat out. Yeah, yeah. That they cannot get enough workers at the moment, which I guess that's the same across the board anyway. Yeah, yeah. But they, they are never short of work, those guys. Good and point. based on that, they, uh, they've actually found that they can increase their margins a little bit. That's good. That's a good strategy. Mm. Yeah, and at the end of the day, Why it's not? all about that, you know, um, achieving that outcome. So it all works towards well, that. Well, yeah, you've got to achieve the outcome, but we're also in this in, in this game to make money, right, and feed our families. So let's not forget that. Yeah, yeah, no, for uh, sure. And, and, you know, which also is That's another reason, reason why you want to make sure you do it right. right. Yeah. Because the effect of rectification can be expensive. All right, so we've, um, we're out of time, Frank, unless you've got anything else that you wanted to add or if there's anything that you wanted to sort of close off with. Um, those of you that we haven't answered your questions, uh, just quickly, just uh, Jane Bailey, if you want to get in contact with us to find out more about any future webinars and things like that, or anyone else for that matter, uh, you can email the address that's up on the screen right now, um, info at gripset.com. Um, I believe that we have all your details as well, the guys that registered. So if Frank is okay with it, I'm happy to share Frank's details as well. Um, if anyone sure. has any questions for him. And Vilami, get in contact with us um, and we'll definitely be able to sort of go through the product range and talk about those things as well. So no problem there. Um, just get in contact with us and we'll get back to you. Frank. Any closing comments, mate? Yeah, um, look, I said it earlier, mate, I absolutely thank Gripset Industries for putting these events on and, and spreading the news, good or bad, in the industry. You know, I, I think, you know, more of these sort of events are, are very, very important. Thanks, Frank. Well, um, and thanks you know, everybody who attended. Yep, thank you. Um, but yeah, thanks to you as well, Frank. So. You know, as we discussed when we sort of started sort of talking about holding this event, you know, the message that we really wanted to send out to everyone is, you know, things change and when changes happen, it can be, you know, a little bit alarming or, you know, and there's a lot of uncertainty that comes with it. Um, you know, you should embrace the change. You, you need to because it's happened, right? This is where we are. This is where we're landed in the industry. Um, you know, the best advice that we can offer is just to try and understand it the best we can. We can't stress enough, you know, especially around these new standards and these new requirements. Get yourselves a copy, buy yourself a copy. It's an investment in your business. Um, and then for anything that you need clarity on, um, you know, you, you can contact Look, well, Industries well, or, or Frank as well. But go on, Frank. Believe it or not, if you have a question about a standard, you can actually send an email to Standards Australia with the question and they will pass that question on to the relevant people in the uh, on the relevant committee so if you don't if you don't want to, if you want to stay anonymous <laughs> yeah and and and, um, and go by standards australia that's certainly possible right. and talking about standards shandy um we're probably two months away from having the new town tiling standard published mm -hmm. so maybe worthwhile to uh, set something up happen and have a chat about that yep sounds good Perfect. Thanks again, awesome. Frank. Really, really appreciate no. your time. No worries. You're a legend. Thank all you, good. mate. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.